Here we go. Get the PowerPoint going. Boom, play from start. All right, it's Friday night, and I want to get to my actual Friday night, so we're going to start this PowerPoint. I have no notes, so going just making stuff up as I go. Hope it's good. American economy, quote, in puberty. There's the famous book, What's Happening to Me, 1800 to 1860, early 1800s. The American economy in puberty. Um, the economy both grew, got bigger, and changed, transformed, just like puberty. Get it? What were the five key changes in the economy? Before you go on, maybe pause the PowerPoint and just take a stab at identifying the five key changes um, based on general knowledge or maybe just what we've talked about in class so far. You, obviously, you don't have to try this, but it makes it, opens your mind, you think a little bit, and um, better able to absorb stuff when I do give it to you. So you want to be a little interactive here and give this a try. Okay, here we go. The first one is expansion, and I have a GIF for GIF playing in the background showing the U.S. expansion over 200 years, and you don't have to get all of that, but I'll let you play it all. Um, so the first reason the economy got bigger is we got bigger. Uh, as we pushed west, this had a dramatic effect on the economy. That's almost too obvious, but still true. And they're running through it again. So you can play that as many times as you want. That is not what you need to memorize for the test, that map. Um, we'll go over that either on another lecture or in class Monday if I'm going to test you on that. Toll gate. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Tollgate Restaurant, but um, that's kind of a connects to this unit and this part of the unit. Connecting. That land that we had just expanded into was big and unsettled. We were able to connect this large land area for trade and settlement. There were two areas where we had innovations that made this possible. What were the two areas? Go ahead and write your guesses now. Well, I'm going to stop briefly and then tell you. Transportation and communication. There are at least six major innovations in, each, in both areas together. What can you come up with? What were the transport? You should come up with at least two, maybe more. Communication ones are a little harder. I'm going to run through them now. Toll roads. Um, roads are actually a big thing that changed. and. Uh, people built better roads, often sometimes plank roads uh, that had wood laid down so it was easier for the wagons. And they would often put a gate at the end, charge a fee for you to go through, and open the gate and let you through. That is actually where the Tollgate restaurant's name come, came from. There was a road from Bethlehem and Slingerlands all the way west to New Scotland and the Delaware River and that was a toll road, and the toll gate was right where the restaurant is now. Uh, that's also where our word turnpike came from, because when they you paid the toll, they would open the pike or pole, preventing you from getting on the road, and you could get on. Canals, big change. Robert Fulton invents the canals. We talked about that earlier in the unit. In sorry, uh, that. Scratch that. Ignore all of that. Canals. It was DeWitt Clinton who built the first big Erie Canal, 15 miles on the Erie Canal, my name is Sal, that began to connect the east with the west. The Erie Canal is actually the most successful by far of all the canals, and it's still out there in New York State, near us and all the way to Buffalo. From Albany to Buffalo. Low bridge. Everybody down. Steamboats, that's what I was going to talk about. Uh, steamboats were very important for transporting people and goods along the riverways and the canals to a certain extent, although canals were generally narrower, and those were invented in the early 1800s by our man Robert Fulton. Railroads, there are actually two great periods for railroads. The, the later 1800s is when they really become important, but they are invented now and they are um, developing, so they do play a role here as well. 
Surprisingly, an efficient postal system uh, was an innovation at this time, and that helps with getting communication between different regions. And then the telegraph gets invented and becomes actually quickly very important. Those are your six. The third reason that the economy grew and transformed in this uh, era is the Industrial Revolution. There have really been two Industrial Revolutions in America, and you need to kind of keep that in mind as we go through the course. The first was in this era, roughly, very rough, the 1820s to the 1850s. The second was um, during and after the Civil War, and so I probably should have put 1860s to 1900 or so, uh, but those are rough dates anyway. Eli Whitney actually had two contributions to the economic changes of this era. Um, one was the cotton gin, which transformed the South, and the other was the system of interchangeable parts. Um, he was con got a contract to deliver muskets to the U.S. Army, and it uh, got the contract partly on his uh, demonstration of a system of building muskets that used interchangeable parts. Um, 50 muskets, he laid them out, kind of interchanged the parts between them, and he showed it was much quicker to construct 50 muskets at once with a set of carefully designed parts than it was to con do it the old-fashioned way of one gun at a time with a master making each one or maybe an apprentice. Very slow hand labor. And this is not like full-scale manufacturing. This is not the assembly line that is going to come about a hundred years later, but it's a step in that direction. Um, so let me speak just briefly about the first industrial revolution of the early 1800s. It is when uh, we begin to use first water power to, to power mills, so fast flowing rivers and streams to turn water wheels that powered mills, and then second, um, steam and the steam engine to power mills. And the first big industry was textiles, weaving cloth and cotton into, weaving cotton into cloth and fabric, uh, and that was primarily in the Northeast. More on the Industrial Revolution, there's a, a loom. Um, you get the development of the factory system in the early 1800s that some of you have read about with your mini project on um, all Americans. From one at a time master and apprentice to large scale production, 300 workers in a mill all doing kind of large scale work together, um, buying mass product of raw materials and then putting it together all at one time. And that develops in England and then the plans are stolen and brought here. Lowell is very important in this and Samuel Slater. Power. Power goes from human and animal power to water power being developed and then steam power. Very important. And it happens in the Northeast more than anywhere else. Regional specialization. Each of the three major regions began to specialize economically. What were the three regions? How did they specialize? take a stab at it. You can probably figure it out from the map. The Northeast, it, sorry, it um, begins to turn towards manufacturing and mills and away from farming, although there's still obviously a lot of farms. The South moves from tobacco and indigo to very much uh, cotton becomes the number one product, and but overall it is big and growing cash crops for export or um, to be used in manufacturing. That's the south. And the third region is the west, um, kind of up here, and they become the nation's breadbasket, growing all the wheat and corn and things that can feed the rest of the region. And that works because of the transportation and communication uh, connections that are being forged around the same time as well. Now you would think that because the regions are becoming more interdependent, 
they rely on the others for their food or their manufactured goods or for the raw materials like cotton that went up to the north in the mills, that they would get along better. But it's not true. They actually begin to have very different interests and start to, this is when sectionalism arises. Um, and one example would be arguing about a tariff. The Northeast liked the idea of a tariff because if British cloth, for example, or textiles had a tariff on them, those imports would make the British imports more expensive and it would make it more likely for people in America to buy the domestic import textiles. Um, whereas the South would not want a high tariff because they want to sell their cotton to England and they want to buy stuff from England and they um, don't want to get slapped with a tariff from England, so they don't want tariffs for us. So even though they're interdependent, the three regions are actually not getting along that well. And the fifth and final reason is immigration and population growth. America had a lot of land, but not many people to fill it. This meant America needed workers. In part, that came from large families, but immigration also helped. America had, um, Americans had a lot of children at that time and a very high birth rate, and that boosted the population. But it was also boosted by immigrants from Northern Europe. The, um, there was a big wave of immigration in the 1840s and 1860, and they came primarily from Northern and Western Europe. The two top countries were Ireland and Germany. Push factors would be, of course, the Irish potato famine and um, troubles in Germany, political revolution that failed and a lot of people came over after that, and economic troubles like floods and famine. Not The famine not nearly as bad as in Ireland, but uh, enough to push people here. Um, the reaction of the non-immigrant Americans was not good. They didn't like the immigrants coming in, and it was probably the nastiest that people were to immigrants. Uh, we're a little anti-immigrant now and it's nothing compared to what it was back then. That reaction is known as nativism. The idea that you are favoring people who were born here over um, citizens who came from another place. Um, that's not the same thing as patriotism or nationalism. You should understand the difference. And um, as an example of kind of the most anti-immigrant group, um, people actually organized political parties there was one called the American Party that um, was specifically designed to stop immigration. They didn't actually accomplish very much, although they had some power in the 1850s. They're called the Know Nothings because if anybody, they were a little bit secretive, and anybody asked them what they were up to, they're like, I know nothing. So they became known as the Know Nothings. That's your lecture. Um, why don't you quiz yourself? That's, we're at 13 minutes, 15 seconds, but um, without looking at your notes, ask yourself these, these questions. Number one, what were the five ways in which the economy grew and transformed? Can you jot them down off the top of your head? That would give you more credit on your lecture note points. What were the two ways we connected this large mass of land? What were the six advances in transportation and communication? What were the key aspects of the first industrial revolution? How did the three regions specialize? And as the in regions became independent, did they get along better? How did America fill its lack of workers? And where did the immigrants come from? And what was the immigrant experience here in America? Um, when you talk about the interdependence and did the number six, did the country, did the regions get along better? Can you explain using tariffs how they didn't? All right, that's it. Have a good weekend. Bye.